welcome back to our next discussion about DeFi regulation. As already discussed in the beginning of the virtual day, regulation will be key for the success of the industry. And you have heard also other speakers talk about, so we move on here at DeFi, as we heard before from Stephen, but also from all other speakers in the panel before. It's a really important topic to talk about. So this applies, the regulation topic applies just as much, if not more, to the DeFi space. And it's my pleasure to welcome Rebecca Rettig, Jacek Czarnecki, Joachim Schwerin, Fabian Scher, and David Johnson as our moderator, who will discuss the importance and the implication of this topic. So David, may I please ask you to take over? Sure, uh, glad to be here and thank you for having us today. Now, this is an exciting topic as we've seen the growth of DeFi uh, really explode uh, the last few years. And so happy to jump in right away with our panel. Uh, I'm gonna ask first uh, Joe Joachim to introduce himself. We'll go around the table and then we'll dive into the topics today. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, Nicolo, for the introduction here. Very pleased to be in this uh, group today and discuss. I'm Joachim Schwerin. I'm principal economist uh, in DG Grow of the European Commission. DG Grow is the director general responsible for the internal market, industry, entrepreneurship, and small and medium-sized enterprises. And in this uh, DG, I'm working in a part that deals with the digital transformation of industry. So basically, my responsibility is the developing the token economy in the EU. Wonderful. Well, glad to have you here today. And uh, Fabian, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. My name is Fabian Chell. I'm a professor at the University of Basel uh, with research focus on public blockchain networks and DeFi. And I've recently published a paper with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis Review. And uh, since then, have been somewhat caught up in the topic of DeFi regulation. Great. And uh, Rebecca? Hi, my name is Rebecca Reddick. I'm the general counsel of the Ave Companies, which is a group of software development companies headquartered in Europe. Um, we developed the Ave Protocol, which is a non-custodial, decentralized liquidity protocol that runs on Ethereum. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And uh, finally, Yasek. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Jacek Czarnecki and I'm a Global Legal Counsel at the Maker Foundation, uh, a community member of um, MakerDAO, uh, which stands behind behind the Maker Protocol, uh, a decentralized finance protocol with DAI as decentralized stablecoin. Great. And Jacek, why don't we uh, begin with you? You know, uh, Maker has really been at the forefront uh, of a lot of DeFi. Curious what you're seeing and sort of how you're adapting to the landscape as things have scaled and become a lot larger than they started. Curious to hear how things are evolving there, especially regarding regulation. Thanks. I think that's that's a really good question because indeed Maker was one of the first, if not the first, decentralized finance projects. And for a long time, it was actually synonymous with decentralized finance. Uh, but one, you know, one thing that I'd like to flag out here is that if you ask me as a representative of Maker, this is actually super interesting to, uh, you know, to to answer this question because uh, the question is that the real question is who is Maker? Right now, the Maker Foundation is actually dissolving uh, because the Maker Protocol is fully decentralized and it's a, an actual decentralized decentralized finance. Um, so. I think that this this marks that the Maker Foundation dissolution marks a real huge step um, towards the uh, you know uh, development and maturity of this of the entire industry, because right now what we have in place are actually decentralized protocols, which are also a challenge from a regulator perspective, and it's been uh, a right uh, over the past few years to get here, um, but it's also a right time to have a discussion right like this one that uh, we're going to have on this panel. Uh, to discuss regulatory and policy topics of how to approach this type of decentralized protocols. That's great. And congratulations on achieving that milestone. I know that takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to uh, to reach that level of decentralization. Uh, Rebecca, love to, uh, to give the same kind of thoughts uh, from your experience. Um, so I think decentralization is a spectrum, um, and I talk about it a lot. I think there is... 
uh, the point in time, the decentralization, I think, has two meanings um, with respect to DeFi. One, these protocols are running on Ethereum, which itself is decentralized, right? It's run by tens of thousands of nodes all across the world. And you do not need anyone for the protocol itself to just continue to run forever. So that in itself, I think these protocols are decentralized from a technological perspective. Whether you have um, decentralization, meaning a, a separation from the, of the original developers from the way that the protocol continues to grow um, is a really important question. Um, Professor Shah and I have been on panels before where we've talked about this concept of decentralization theater, where people just are using the word decentralization or using DeFi to talk about protocols that still have things like centralized order books or, <coughs> excuse me, deep involvement <coughs> from the original developers. So the way... I'm sorry, the way that the Aave companies um, have decentralized themselves or divorced themselves from the protocol is they turned over the admin keys to community governance so that all decisions and growth and changes for the protocol are made by the community. So there are tens of thousands of independent wallet addresses that hold either Aave or staked Aave, which allows them to do one of two things, to make proposals, to upgrade or change um, the protocol, and then to vote on those proposals as well. Um, we we don't change, you know, we don't have involvement in terms of changing, growing, developing the protocol, um, and we've turned it over to the community, which I think is a really important thing. And for me, um, I'm very invested in the concept of decentralization for a variety of reasons and um, DeFi. But I think that when you have um, the users and the community. Uh, or ecosystem that is connected to the protocol, um, invested in its own growth, it's almost safer for the system um, because people are interested in what is important to them when they're using these protocols and so making those types of proposals. That's great. Thank you for that, Rebecca. It really reminds me of sort of uh, the debate that's been had over the years over how to define what is truly open source, right? And the Apache Foundation, what they came up with, you know, more than half of the code being from developers that aren't just uh, the original um, And so I, I, it's good to see that we're sort of getting to the same kind of standards of maturity. Uh, Fabian, you want to take it from here on your perspective? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think Jacek and Rebecca have raised some really good points, and I also agree with your comparison. Uh, maybe I'd also make a comparison to the early days of blockchain, because also there I wasn't quite sure what we're actually talking about, and the, uh, the term that came from a really decentralized idea was actually hijacked at some point by completely permissioned ledgers that haven't been too much more than glorified databases, and uh, I completely agree with Rebecca on that, that we're currently seeing um, some companies, and in that case, they are really companies who are just using the label DeFi uh, to get around regulation. And I think that's really important also for policymakers and regulators uh, that they understand that there is no clear definition of decentralized finance at this point, and there are many different opinions on what this actually means. So the only thing they can do when they are evaluating the DeFi protocols is actually looking into these protocols, looking at the various layers, so looking at the blockchain on the very bottom, uh, the blockchain itself could be centralized, and then it doesn't really matter what you're doing on top. Then looking at the assets, so the tokens, if, that, if they have any uh, special privileges, looking at the protocols themselves and really moving through all of these layers and uh, checking if the protocols and everything below actually are decentralized. Oh, that's great. Joe Akeem? Yes. Uh... It's perfect what Fabian said, because this is precisely the process. And I think when we talk about regulation and decentralization, we should look at where we stood 10 years ago and where we want to go. 10 years ago, we had the financial crisis. We were just coming out of that. And we realized that we had 75% of financing of small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe in the banking sector. Banking sector being centralized, having a lot of regulation and being full of risk. And this is precisely the starting point where then we looked at alternatives and then decentralized uh, finance came out in the form of, let's say, non-blockchain applications, crowdfunding. It moved through fintech, the whole pipeline, blockchain, tokens, where we are now. And the important part of that from a political perspective, also from a regulatory perspective, in my opinion, is the philosophy behind it. Regulation, in my view, always comes last and doesn't come at the beginning. 
And therefore, it's very important to see that here now we not only have the crowd, we not only have the interest, the incentive, but also the technology to really push for decentralization. And this requires a completely different governance approach also in terms of regulation than before. We don't have these mature markets any longer. We have basically a lot of uh, innovation. You have a lot of fighting for the market as such and an enormously high rate not only of innovation but also of recombination of innovation. And the key point for me is less so regulation, but it is educating the policymakers and regulators to understand what is actually going on here. For the technology as such, you don't need regulation. For the development of the business model in an early stage, you do not need regulation. At the end of the day, for what you needed is the dissemination and the scaling. And then you have the same issues that repeat all over the time, basically, of what do you actually want. If your focus is on innovation, there's no harm in leaving that in an open space. But if, of course, you want to reach scale, and if, and that's the topic of the discussion today, certainly in the conference, to get the institutional investors in the family offices, etc., they need to have certain safeguards, and then you more move into the regulated domain. But one thing is very important in the sense that you will never get a fine-tuned regulation, in my opinion, as in, let's say, more traditional financial markets, because of the very fast development of the technologies and applications that we discuss here. What you will get, and we have started that with the MICA regulation, is a sort of a sort of umbrella, which then needs to be adapted and interpreted in the light of new developments like the recent DeFi developments, others that we are discussing here today. And that requires a completely different approach from regulators and policymakers than before. They must become enablers and not preventers, and that's the biggest challenge. Can I I'm so sorry, can I jump in because this is like so everything that I feel. Um, Please, go ahead. To hear, you know, somebody uh, in the regulatory realm talk like this, it's very important because DeFi is a completely new paradigm, right? Like uh, I analogizing it, I analogize it to something like text messages where it, it's not a phone call and it's not a letter. It's a completely new way to communicate. And so I think that DeFi is a completely new way with a completely new asset class to think about financial autonomy and financial independence or participation in some sort of um, financial system. And so old regulations are, are really written um, for third-party intermediaries because third-party intermediaries, whether they're institutions or individuals, you know, have subjective judgment and subjective intent when they're acting. And so there needs to be this level playing field. But I talk a lot about how the smart contracts underlying these protocols all work automatically. So there's no, there's certainty in transactions and there's no subjective judgment that people have to be uh, concerned about. So old paradigm regulations don't make sense for how DeFi operates now. That's not to say that some form of um, as we as we were talking about just a minute ago, some form of regulation does make sense to give certainty um, in at least who you're interacting with on these protocols and the like. Um, but as far as, you know, and so I think we need to think about regulation in a new way and what consumer protection means in this context. Um, so I, I feel very strongly about that and feel very aligned um, with everything that was just said. <laughs> That's that's wonderful. No, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm curious just to step back for one second, uh, and then we can continue. Uh, just for giving the audience a bit of uh, a framework to think about this spectrum of decentralization as we've talked about it. You know, I wrote the paper for decentralized applications back in 2013, and I posited effectively you had four criteria. Is it open source? Is it peer-to-peer? -peer? Does it have a blockchain backend? And is there a token to incentivize a distributed community behavior to do something for the network, right? And so as people are thinking about these new systems, a lot of people are using DeFi washing, right? Just throw the label on there, ask those questions, right? Does it, is it open source? That's a prerequisite, does it have these different things? But I'm curious to hear from, uh, from Yasik on the same uh, thread that Rebecca was just talking about. We may well see a lot of these traditional protections emerge from the market. We're, right, we're starting to see insurance, Nexus Mutual, things like that, where people are insuring DeFi contracts. I'm curious about, from your perspective, how, what you're seeing in the market actually develop in the way of protections, insurance, sort of things that you'd expect of a mature market where institutionals are looking to get involved. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, um, over the past years, and especially months, we are seeing um, 
kind of like the emergence of a new financial system, because I think that what's uh, very important here is that what we are seeing is about development of a completely new financial infrastructure, which is different to what we've seen in the fintech space over the past years. It was mainly about distribution, distribution built on top of the existing infrastructures. Now it's about building of new infrastructures and completely new financial primitives. Uh, so also including you know, a, a broad suite of, of various types of completely new financial services and products, which as the, you know, the, the usual um, analogy goes, you can, you can stick together like, like, like uh, Lego bricks, uh, uh, building money Legos and building completely new products. And I think that's also relevant from uh, the regulatory and policy perspective, because I, I fully agree with Rebecca. It's, it's like, uh, you know, we, we know for a long time that this is not banks who should be regulated. What should be regulated from the regulatory and methodological perspective is banking activity. So this concept is not new on focusing on real activity uh, not necessarily on, uh, you know, uh, some, some form of intermediaries that, that happen to conduct this activity. And this concept should, should apply here as well. I mean, you basically, end of day, have new financial infrastructures, on top of which there is going to be a distribution layer, and there is already, to some extent, a distribution layer to which you are going to apply some, you know, probably uh, financial regulatory uh, principles in the current form. But then those infrastructures, those new financial primitives, they need a completely new approach. And this is something I think that we all uh, agree about. That's great. Well, uh, Fabian, curious about your, your thoughts on the same topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, usually I uh, agree with all of the other participants. I mean, this isn't the first panel we have together, but this would be super boring. So let us let me play devil's advocate for a second. Yeah, <laughs> I actually have a different opinion. Um, I think, in principle, it's completely right what David have said so far, but we shouldn't forget one thing. I mean, many of the protocols that are out there currently uh, are not decentralized uh, yet or aren't decentralized at all. And what I'm worried just as much as a regulator who does step in uh, with every single protocol and doesn't allow for any innovation is a regulator that doesn't step in at all. I mean, I, I even heard some people talking about Libra DM as decentralized finance, which is, which is completely ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. When you have uh, somewhat centralized uh, blockchains so we have to be really careful i mean it's really it's really two ends of the spectrum on the one hand you don't want to undermine the true innovation and the decentralization but on the other hand you really have to make sure that you actually understand these protocols look into them and don't let somebody get away with something that is actually completely centralized just because they have that label yeah, I, I completely agree with the point on decentralization. To go back to your original question, David, about like how are we proliferating um, risk mitigation strategies and ideas to allow investors to come in, I'll give you two concrete examples. They both come from the update companies because that's what I have and know. But so in something like a risk mitigation mechanism, we've built something and deployed it, and it's also decentralized and run by government governance called the safety module, which is a protocol um, a decentralized protocol that allows individuals to stake their Aave or to stake the liquidity um, token from the balancer of a ETH pool. And they can earn rewards because they've staked it. Um, but all, all participants in the safety module understand that in the case of a shortfall event on the Aave protocol, governance can vote to slash 30% of the funds that are in the safety module to, to repay any losses that any users of the Aave protocol Mm. experience. It's all run by governance. Um, it's all going to be subject to a vote, but that is a risk mitigation mechanism that I think um, is intended to replicate the types of risk mitigations that are in the traditional financial system, um, but in a decentralized way. So that's one. And we just announced a few weeks ago, um, and this is slightly different, that there will be a permissioned version of the Aave protocol that is going to be deployed in probably end of the month or or sometime in July. Um, it's literally the same underlying smart contracts for the protocol, except there's another layer of smart contracts on top that allows for the whitelisting of wallet addresses. So there's going to be completely separate and apart from Aave, there will be, um, to start, one whitelister and then multiple whitelisters. 
um, who will be approved by governance. So if you want to be a whitelister, you have to make a proposal to Ave governance, um, explain why and things like that. But they'll all be regulated entities who can conduct KYC and AML um, uh, checks on anyone who wants to, per to participate in the permissioned version of um, the protocol. And so there will be certainty for institutional investors or in the case of the United States, you know, investors who are subject to the BSA or need to know, you know, with whom they're interacting or that they've been through a specific KYC process. Um, and so that also is another way that um, should start allowing institutional investors, hedge funds, family offices to become more involved in DeFi um, and to have some certainty around what they need as far as compliance, but also be able to participate in this decentralized you know, new financial system. That's great. And that actually is a perfect transition to the next topic. And, and Joe Akeem, maybe you can kick us off on this topic, which is what Rebecca is saying is, is we're effectively seeing the merger between, you know, DeFi and the more traditional finance, right? Permissioned versus permissionless, right? And, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time, you know, sort of understanding that that bridge the last year uh, took a company, uh, public DLTX in Europe, and we're doing all blockchain and crypto activities, right? And it's, you know, what can you put on the balance sheet? What can you explain to regulators and investors? Curious about your, your perspective of these bridges that are developing between the permissionless and the permission economy. Well, it's very interesting what you ask because the last panel I attended a few days ago ended with the question, can DeFi live without CeFi? And uh, we seem to get back to the point. And um, I just also wanted to react before I come to that, perhaps to what uh, Fabian has uh, just said, because I find that question a very important one, actually. There are no extremes. So it's completely wrong not to look into anything. It's absolutely wrong to fine tune uh, everything. But the complexity, and that gives also part of the answer to your question, is um, that uh, we have here a mixture of things. We are at this moment from a political regulatory perspective looking very much into smart contracts. And we have a lot of thinking about this, this uh, issue, how we deal with that question. At the end of the day, it's not about politicians or regulators being willing or unwilling to do stuff. But there's really fundamental questions that we are addressing here where you have a combination of economic, legal, and IT sectors where you cannot be an expert in one of these fields. You have to put that together in all of these fields and you have to also see the cross-cutting aspects. I mean, why would it be useful to regulate, for example, DeFi from a risk perspective in a different way than self-driving vehicles, completely self-driving vehicles. There's a liability, and whether that lies with the programmer or the producer or whatever you, you have at the end of the day, these are very clear horizontal questions that cannot be discussed in isolation in each field. And that requires a completely new set of skills. So I feel that here, in a sense, uh, there is a very strong shift from silo thinking, which we have more on mature markets, which we have more in the legacy system, to a completely flexible intellectual approach where we not only need to find new ideas in terms of regulation, but also in terms of philosophy that really underpins on the one hand side this, for me, most fascinating aspect that you want to get to true decentralization, but on the other hand side, you have a community. And the one cannot live without the other. The community actually is a safeguard. It protects because the community is strong, but it's not a state, it's not an enterprise, it's something else. And the individual as such should be empowered to do what she or he wants, but forms part of that community. And in that sense, actually, I find that from that perspective, I don't find anything useful. I'm a PhD economist in current reading on economics literature, but I find very much useful things when I look back 200 years to read Hegel, Fichte, Kant, philosophers, I basically have this dichotomy of life and where things are coming together. And now indeed here as well, there's, we've seen it in a previous discussion today, a lot of people coming from the legacy system into DeFi or into crypto to, let's say, bring their ideas in and develop that further at the end of the day. But this is just a trajectory. The long-term future is going back to the roots. And the, the roots of economic and societal systems are not central banks, are not centralized entities. The roots are communities at grassroots level that basically took their decision and then it scaled. And my feeling is that we are going back in this direction very much. We have a very confusing, complex, challenging transition period but the train has very clearly moved in the direction uh, where we are going. And that means that, yes, for a time being, it's very important to look at how can I come in safely from a traditional perspective, have my investments, have my return, etc. At the end of the day, most people that I talk to 
at least those uh, that are not really from the financial part have no interest whatsoever primarily in return, but more in the other things, and return comes by itself if you just go into that direction. Mm. No, that's a great way of putting it. Well, I'd love your uh, thoughts on this topic as well, Fabian. Yeah, I mean, um, I cannot disagree with Joachim on any of anything he said. On that level, I mean, it's somewhat romantic, and I think it's great when you put it like that. But in practice, uh, I'm, I'm afraid things will get super messy, and it's not that easy. I mean, uh, at some point, you have to put these words into actual policies. You have to regulate it somehow, and then there will be a line somewhere, right? And then you have to say, okay, uh, something is regarded as decentralized if it doesn't cross this specific line, and then maybe a certain set of regulations will not apply. And once it crosses that line, it's a financial intermediary. And I think that will be a challenge. I mean, uh, yes, we can agree on a high level, but I, I really think that this will be a super big challenge and completely messy. I, I agree, but there is but actually, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, there's actually, I think, one principle that regulators and policymakers love, and I, I hear them repeating it all, all, you know, over and over again, which is about, uh, you know, same business, same risks, same, uh, mm -hmm. same rules, right? And this is just perfectly 100% right. Uh, in, and if you apply it to different models, you can see even the same business, but just a different risk profile, just because you're using a different technology, which gets rid of some risks, but perhaps introduces some more risks. And this is just perfect, and I think that, you know, in terms of discussing the centralization theater, whether some models are more or less decentralized, I think that we should get rid of the moral judgment. I mean, in some cases, actually centralized services, centralized providers or hybrid services may make more sense. Uh, they, they may or may not, depending on, you know, end of day on, on users, right? And the risks they introduce or, 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 or remove from the system. Uh, but, you know, by sticking to this simple regulatory perspective, uh, regulatory principle uh, that, that I mentioned, I think that this is just, uh, you know, a perfect way to do this. And this is where I think everyone in the room is always aligned, right? Both regulators, market participants, members of academia. Of course, devil is in the details here, right? How to do yeah. this in practice and how to apply this methodology. And of course, there is additional challenge to actually getting, you know, getting into details, getting behind the curtain and seeing whether, you know, whether the business is actually the same or what are actually the risks. And this is the most challenging part. And here, just just want to get back to one one of the Joachim's, uh, Joachim's uh, uh, initial comments about education. This is, I think, the, the main uh, the main thing that we need right now. And this is why I find this type of panel so useful, because we need to really get to the bottom and we need people, including regulators, to understand what, what they are dealing with. Makes sense. Rebecca, you were saying? All I was going to say is I think the standard for centralization has to be defined in a particular way. And it's almost in the, do you have control over user funds? Now, that means one of two things, taking custody. Um, you know, the company, DeFi software developers do not take custody of funds. Um, the question is then, do the protocols ever take custody? The answer, at least in most DeFi protocols, is no. But then there's a third question, which goes to centralization, which is, do the software developers have the ability to control the protocol such that it will impact user assets? And if the answer is yes, right, they hold the admin keys, they hold a guardian key where they can shut down the protocol, whatever it may be. But if you have the ability to impact user assets in some way, then you are have some level of centralization and then have to be, because there's this human subjective intent, subjective judgment, then you do need regulation to control that in a number of ways. I think about regulation in a truly decentralized world to almost regulate the standards for things like security audits, how you develop um, things before they're deployed, uh, and things like that. You know, more consumer protection, what level of disclosure do you need to make about your security audits or whatever else may impact user assets, right? There are these two pieces. If you're really going to be decentralized, what does that really mean in terms of regulation? And that, that probably does not mean ongoing regulation if you don't have this ability to impact user assets. But if you have the ability to impact user assets, then you do need to be, do need to be subject to some level of regulation. Mm, that's uh, a really good point. Go ahead. 
I think we have to be aware that there are much more, many more levels to that. I mean, I completely agree on the protocol level, but as I said in the beginning, also you have to think about the blockchain, you have to think about the assets themselves. For example, when you have a liquidity pool and you have assets in there, even if the people who are controlling the liquidity pool, they don't have any admin keys or who set up the liquidity pool, excuse me, don't have any admin keys or any special privileges. When, for example, with the asset itself, there is a function implemented where you can just assign a new owner, where you can expropriate, where you can blacklist, and it doesn't really matter. Again, when the blockchain itself can be just rewritten, and then it's controlled by a single entity, it doesn't really matter what you deploy on top of it. And that's what I'm saying. I think at the end of the day, we're all saying the same thing. Um, that is that we really have to look into these protocols and judge them one by one. Um, where we disagree slightly, I suppose, is that I think it is much more complicated than it might seem and will get really messy in practice. And uh, I'm somewhat worried that when, when policymakers or regulators introduce uh, these kinds of regulations, um, that it will be really hard to actually enforce them and draw a line. But Fabian, if I just may uh, jump in very briefly, that's exactly always the challenge. And that is why I respect and fully understand and share your concern. On the other hand side, I warn against the fine tuning and I've seen it in so many uh, instances. I completely agree that it's very important, for example, to check and regulate the interface between the fiat and the crypto world, because that is where you get in and get out. And this is an absolutely decisive point. It's completely the other question what you do inside at the end of the day within certain limits. I'm also very much on the side of Rebecca to look at the ex ante conditions, the standards, etc. But I fully warn against looking at each and every smart contract. At the end of the day, it's a community thing. When there's a big tech who is leveraging power from other markets into this, uh, there's, a, there's a big concern for policymakers and regulators, but that's a different community. Community. I feel many of the communities we are talking about here are self-driven and incentivized communities that know very well how to govern things. And that governance is perhaps a topic for another topic, but that brings me to the essence, which is more the self-regulation. And if that fails, of course, then the regulator has to jump in. But from my experience, it's the second best. Very good. Good. So, David, um, I'm jumping in here. Uh, we have some questions from our participants, and I would love if you would continue this discussion afterwards also in the networking room, where participants can really uh, well, ask you questions in a, in a more detailed way also. So we have here, wow, several questions. I'll just take out two. Um, first one is, is the whole space walking on thin ice and completely dependent on Tether? Consider this hypothetical scenario. Tarek comes out and says it's commercial paper reserves is in all we quality corporate debt or BTC. Does the whole DeFi bubble pop when the market realizes Tether is not collateralized? Bobby, and you look like you have an opinion on that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, also probably, I mean, it's, it's not fair if you ask uh, Arve or Maker to this question, right? And probably the most new. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I don't think so. I don't think that DeFi is reliant on Tether at all. I mean, you could make the argument for some aspects of the cryptocurrency market, maybe. I'm also skeptical there, but definitely not for DeFi. I mean, in DeFi, you have different stable coins that are dominant. And uh, yeah, I, I guess Yatsek has to say something about that because DAI is one of them. Yes, I would say, I mean, for sure, there are some concerns about uh, Tether and, and some other um, uh, cryptocurrencies, right? That's for sure. And that may pose some risk for the entire crypto market. But at the same time, I actually think that in the same way as Ava or Maker alternatives for traditional finance, they are also alternative for Tether and the like. I would say that first of all, Fabian is absolutely right. And second, we actually look at this. Uh, we compared the price movement for, for Tether with the bad news, uh, also with all the history that you know, and basically there's a zero correlation. And my conclusion from that is that a lot of people are concerned about Tether. It's exactly not the people that are using it. So that should tell you something. If I may add one more thing, I mean, DeFi actually solves the issue, the trust issue with Tether when you think about it. So all of these concerns can potentially be solved by DeFi. And you have the, the collateral on chain. Well, but exactly. Good. Then perfect. Then thank you all for this valuable and interesting exchange. And hopefully we will see you all next year in St. Moritz in January, in person, of course, to this, uh, continue this discussion and see how the industry evolves.